so I was in a really bad way and the doctors had placed a feeding tube and they had told me my condition would only deteriorate and one day even a feeding tube wouldn't be enough. My name is Mel and this is my story of how I went from completely dependent on a feeding tube and struggling to sustain myself to now having my feeding tube removed and being able to completely sustain myself orally and healing from my chronic illnesses in ways I never thought were possible. So I'm gonna take you all the way back to the beginning of this story and I have had struggles with food intolerances since infancy, beginning with struggles tolerating breast milk. And throughout my childhood, I kind of had food intolerances come and go to different degrees, but the point where it really started to impact my life was 2009. I had had a trigger that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, and that's really when I can trace that my chronic illness symptoms really started. That's when I started to really be impacted by food intolerances and it started to impact my day-to-day -day life and I was a young teenager at that point. Over the next five years we kind of did some elimination diets on our own like myself and my family and we found that gluten and dairy were a big culprit hi baby so we cut out gluten and dairy and my symptoms improved but i was still really struggling and then in 2014 it's kind of where it all hit the fan <laughs> I became bed bound and very very seriously ill and my food intolerances went through the roof. I had a lot of irritable bowel like symptoms and a lot of also histamine and other amine and salicylate sensitivity as well. So the list of foods I could tolerate was very very small like count on your fingers sort of small including like herbs and spices the only thing I could tolerate in that department was salt. When all this went down we didn't really have a diagnosis. In my teenage years when we'd been seeing doctors the diagnosis that they had given me was irritable bowel syndrome and anxiety and I really see that especially looking back as just a blanket term that they gave me for look you're having these symptoms but we've only got a 10 minute GP appointment so this is just the most obvious thing that it could be and so that's kind of the diagnosis I got without having in-depth testing or further investigation to really get to the root of what the problem was. I also want to say that it took a while, like a few years, to even have somebody diagnose me with that because most people just said, look, this is normal for a teenage girl. You're just stressed, school stressful, high school stressful. Just go home and go back to school. Those two diagnoses of IBS and anxiety, later on, I ended up getting more in-depth diagnoses that kind of better explained what was going on with my symptoms and I've got a lot of other diagnosis videos to show how I got to those points of getting diagnosed with POTS, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, cervical, craniocervical instability, MALS, a lot of other things. I vlogged part of my experience from 2020 onwards kind of going through testing and getting some of those diagnoses but the diagnosis or diagnoses that specifically relate to why I ended up with a feeding tube is MALS which stands for median arcuate ligament syndrome and bowel dysmotility. So bowel dysmotility was a diagnosis I was given by my gastroenterologist and that's kind of when the nerves in the stomach aren't quite functioning as well as they could and it slows down the motility in the stomach. MALS is considered an anatomical condition where the diaphragm sits too low and compresses the nerves in the stomach. It can cause a lot of very severe pain, nausea and a whole host of other symptoms and I'll link down below my diagnosis story of how I got diagnosed with that and also my symptoms of that. And as for the other foods, the histamine, sensitivity, and that sort of thing that ruled out a lot of foods for me that was caused by mast cell syndrome so if i have a video of that coming out in the future of how i got diagnosed with that my symptoms of that i'll link that down below as well from 2014 to 2018 2019 that list of foods that i was able to tolerate drastically started to decrease until it got to the point where the only thing i could tolerate were plain potato crisps so like a packet of plain potato chips and I had to soak it in hot water and then strain the water out so that I could chew it with my jaw but also so I could digest it. And basically it had gotten to this point because whenever I ate anything I'd be in excruciating pain like balled up in a ball in bed for hours upon hours upon hours and the rest of the day and all through the night I'd be in excruciating pain for just eating a really tiny amount. Or food and I would also feel really really 
ill. The most nauseous I've ever been in my life and I've always been a motion sick girl so just room spinning like so dizzy, so nauseous and just feeling so so sick. And so basically there was this large period of my life around 2018-2019 where it got a lot worse for me and I had to force feed myself these plain potato chips and then I would just be, these would cause, cause the least amount of symptoms, these plain potato chips, and then I would just be curled up in bed with a hot pack in excruciating pain and just not wanting to move at all because of how dizzy I was, not wanting to be more than a few steps away from the bathroom. And that was a really hard time. And we were really trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Again, <laughs> check out those videos that kind of explain that whole diagnosis story. I don't want to go into the details here, but it took a long time to get those diagnoses for doctors to really go there's something really an issue here and by the time we finally got to a specialist they told me that I was a risk of being unalive they prescribed me baby formula straight away and at that point I was just sipping tiny amounts of it so I'd mix it with water and sip tiny tiny amounts of it throughout the day and this caused really severe symptoms but I was kind of able to do it able to force myself to do it and I gained the initial weight that I needed to gain that really helped but over time there was just less and less I could tolerate so in 2020 I got a naso feeding tube placed through my nose that went into my stomach attached to a pump and so what this basically did was it dripped I could set the rate of how many meals per hour it would feed into my stomach and so it was just like a little drip into my stomach over the whole day and night and that helped because it was just such a small quantity and that helped but I still was really 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 struggling to tolerate that so in 2021 I got a surgical feeding tube placed in my stomach and I had one tube that went into my stomach and one tube that went into my intestines and basically what this meant is that we could feed straight into my intestines bypassing my stomach just that drip 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 into my intestines so that I could avoid having the stomach pain and the nausea and things like that this helped a lot by this time I had gained a lot of the weight that I had needed to gain and this was really good the problem was I got a hospital infection when I got that feeding tube placed. Basically, you have a hole in your stomach where the feeding tube goes from the outside of your abdominal to the inside of your stomach, and that's kind of considered a chronic wound. And so that infection became chronic because the wound was just always there and it didn't close up. And so I had to go on really strong antibiotics. I had to go on ciprofloxacin, or however you say it, often called Cipro, which I really knew the dangers of it, but I was also hospitalized with this uh, hospital infection and so I didn't have much of a choice. And then I was on uh, different antibiotics by IV drip and then over the next five months I was on all sorts of different antibiotics and it really, really, really damaged my gut and I got a lot worse and all of a sudden I stopped tolerating my formula. And this was really scary. So this is the end of 2021. I think I really started to experience this in about October 2021, where I was like, okay, this is getting serious. Like I'm really, really struggling. I just can't tolerate this. I was having explosive diarrhea. Like I was losing weight again. Like my body was just rejecting it. And I'd actually thrown up my feeding tube as well. So it had come out of my intestine when I throw, threw up and it was sitting in my stomach, which meant the feed going through there was going into my stomach so it was just really not good. I was really malnourished again. It took a while because, you know, the emergency room visit told me there was nothing wrong with my tube and by the time we finally were able to see my specialist about it he was like oh yeah your tube's totally not in your intestines but I had another surgery coming up in December and my endometriosis excision surgery. I'll link the resources I have for that down below. I have a vlog but I'm also about to film some more videos on that to kind of give you guys more context of what's helped me and my diagnosis story and all that sort of thing. My gastroenterologist said it must have been about late November at this point and he was like you have a surgery in December there's no point us doing a surgery now to put the feeding tube back in your intestines because you will be throwing up after your surgery because that's just how it went for me I always throw up after surgery so you'll probably throw the feeding tube up again so I went through the surgery it's uh, for the endometriosis surgery it's a good thing too because I was throwing up non-stop 
for four days. After that, I was in the hospital on a drip. So two weeks after that surgery, I got another surgery to put the feeding tube back. And this was just before Christmas, like the day before Christmas or two days before Christmas. So I could start feeding into my intestine again and that really helped, but I was still, my body was just getting the formula out and I was losing weight and I was malnourished and I could not tolerate the formula. And this was a really scary time for us. So now we're going into January, 2022. And I finally got a hold of my allergist immunologist and he said, look, like this is the only formula you could tolerate. It was a specially designed formula for people who have really severe intolerances and it was actually for infants and children. And basically it had the proteins broken apart so the body couldn't recognize it as food. And so he was like, this is the most hypoallergenic formula that there is. You can't tolerate this. You can't tolerate anything. And basically I had identified that the ingredient in it that I was probably having trouble tolerating was high fructose corn syrup. Now I knew this was in there the whole time and I just ignored it because I was like, you know, that's not healthy, but it's going to give me the calories I need to gain the weight and it's going to sustain me. And I'm going to pick that over, you know, not being alive. I really had ignored that until this point where I was like, all right, we need to find a formula without that. Why that ingredient is in baby formula, I really don't know, but I eventually got on to my dietitian and she's like yep i know another formula that doesn't have that ingredient we can try it so we tried that and i was tolerating it a little, little bit better but i still wasn't doing great and so at this point my husband and i are like all right well how are we going to sustain you at this point i've been malnourished for a few months and i'm really struggling again and the doctors had told me when they had placed my surgical feeding tube that my condition was just going to deteriorate and eventually even a feeding tube wouldn't be enough and at this point i thought that that was coming true and it was just instead of coming true over a decade which I thought it could come true in less than a year that was really scary we were considering whether we needed to go to the states like go to the US we live in Australia whether we needed to fly to the US to get mouth surgery whether I needed to get a central line and be fed through my veins on something called TPN which I have great compassion from anyone on there and I never want to be on that because the risks are so high we just we didn't know what to do to sustain me now i had a friend named rachel ribeye rach as she's known on the internet she's one of my best friends and she had been doing something called the carnival diet for the last year and she was really 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 sick and she had a similar stomach condition to me she had gastroparesis she had seen major healing through the carnivore diet. So I was like, all right, you know what? We are desperate. I am not gonna live if we don't do something. I've got nothing to lose. I'm gonna try this diet. So I said to my dietitian, I was like, at the time I was aiming for the GAPS diet and I still, that's my still long-term goal. I want to be able to introduce more foods to get to that. I was like, this is my goal. I'm hoping it'll save my life will you help me? And she said yes. So basically there's this problem because on the carnivore diet, you're eating pretty much just animal products and I couldn't tolerate any food. So I went under the guidance of my dietitian. We started with one eighth of a teaspoon of turkey mince once every three days. And so my husband had cooked up some turkey mince and we had portioned it into these tiny, tiny portions of one eighth of a teaspoon of turkey mince. I had it once every three days. And so I'm still having the other formula to supplement, but only a small amount. And I also started to introduce eggs because I had already started introducing a little bit of egg yolk on my soaked potato chips. And so at that point I was still eating the soaked potato chips as well. And so basically as time went, I really slowly <laughs> increased that. So I'd have like one eighth of a teaspoon of turkey mince, maybe once every second day, and then maybe once a day, and then I'd up it a little bit. And we kept going from there. Basically over the next six or seven months, I kept doing that. And I got to the point where I was like, all right, I really feel, I'd been doing a lot of research on it. I really feel that inflammatory seed oils and vegetable oils could be playing a huge part here. This is another thing that we knew was unhealthy for me, but we had to ignore for the sake of calories because I couldn't tolerate coconut oil and olive oil because they were very high in histamines. And so we relied on sunflower oil for calories and they were obviously on the potato chips that I was eating to sustain my 
life so at this point I was like we need to work on being able to replace that oil and at the beginning of 2022 I had started on some mast cell stabilizers that ended up really really helping my histamine sensitivity and helped calm down the nerves in my stomach and they were cotodophan and low dose naltrexone the endometriosis surgery I had in the end of 2021 also really really helped the pain the nerve pain in my stomach it also really helped with my gastrointestinal symptoms and those IBS like symptoms as well we're about July 2022 now and I really wanted to introduce these other oils my mast cells had kind of settled down with those medications a little bit I worked with my dietitian and we kind of just did one drop of coconut oil once every three days and we kind of did that cycle again of increasing that over time until I could just eat coconut oil and I can eat coconut oil now basically as much as I want like I'm not going to drink it out the thing but my histamine sensitivity is fine with it so then we got an air fryer and we started working on introducing actual potatoes and cooking them in the coconut oil instead of the sunflower oil that was a process too and I did struggle to tolerate the actual potato versus the potato chips and my formula had the sunflower oil in it too so we were tapering that back I don't exactly know I think it was around September 20 2022 is when I was able to completely cut out seed oils and this is where things changed about two weeks after that I noticed a world of difference and it was like I had a whole new digestive system from that point on the amount of meat I could tolerate just went up at like such an incredible speed so I was eating mince like beef mince whereas for years and years before that beef felt too heavy for me to tolerate. I was eating lamb. I wasn't really eating turkey mince anymore because I kind of have a bad association. <laughs> Mainly eating chicken, beef and lamb. And so I'd have small portions regularly throughout the day. And then basically just over time, it's continued to increase over the rest of 22 and all through 2023. The amount that I can eat in one sitting and over an entire day has just continued to in increase. So because I had made so much progress after cutting out the seed oils. In September of 2022, I had my feeding tube removed and I'd had another big infection flare up. And at this point, I didn't quite feel ready to have the feeding tube removed. Like I wanted a little bit more time where I was tolerating things okay, where I was off my formula because I had been off my formula for a little while now. And I wanted a bit more time so that just so that I knew it was sustainable because I still wasn't quite like uh, like the amount that I was eating a day was still quite small at this point um, and so I wanted to make sure that it was actually sustainable because it kind of wasn't at this point but I was just doing the best that I could. The the um, infections that I mentioned in my last vlog, I have a bladder infection and a feeding tube infection at the moment. Um, so at this point, we're almost at the end of 2022 and I've had my feeding tube for like almost a year and a half now. And we've been pretty much fighting fires the entire time and it's just it's putting a lot of stress on my body, it's really affecting my quality of life. And I just don't want to be on too many antibiotics all the time. So I'm very consider very seriously considering getting my feeding tube taken out and getting a naso tube back in. I have made a lot of progress. I'm very grateful um, for the progress that I've made. But I haven't quite made enough progress that I can go without a feeding tube. Hey guys, so it's the next day. I'm about to go and get an ultrasound on my abdomen. I saw the doctor late yesterday afternoon and she said that she is concerned that there's something brewing in my abdomen. Um, she she like did some tests where she felt around my abdomen and stuff and my lower abdomen has been very sore. Um, so she sent me for an ultrasound and some bloods it has been so hard getting appointments um so she said by doing that she's trying to keep me out of the hospital at the moment yeah i'm waiting for the gastro to call to see what options i have yes but i also didn't want to go back on antibiotics and go backwards um i didn't want to be hospitalized again 
um, because I knew that that could really kind of set me back in all this progress I had made and I'd spent the entire year of 2022 up to September here making all that progress so I decided it has to come out and it was a really hard decision and it was a really emotional decision and I didn't feel ready for it simply because I didn't want to go through the trauma of the surgery again if I needed it that surgery was actually quite traumatic for me and it was a five month recovery the feeding tube surgery I had in 2021 so I didn't feel ready but I was like this is just what I need to do to sustain myself and for me I'm really lucky and it worked out really well because when the tube came out and the hole that was in my stomach where the tube was going through it closed up and the infection healed this is what allowed me to like make that significant improvement to then like really sustaining myself and getting to where I am now like that was another milestone where things just improved so much and they just snowballed from there to where I am now in a good way like getting better and better and better and better and so because that infection was chronic it was really really affecting me with the whole closed up that infection could finally heal and go away but also I didn't have a hole in my stomach anymore and just getting that out really really helped at that point that was September 2022 I got that out and it was incredible and while it was so such an emotional roller coaster it it uh, it was we really celebrated that I had got it out because it was only at the beginning of that year that we were like questioning again how I was going to sustain myself in the previous two years I think I ended up having my tube for at least two years combined nasal tube and surgical feeding tube it was at least two years that I was feeding tube dependent um formula dependent so it was really really exciting and at the time my gastroenterologist had written me a letter like a doctor's letter and a script for a naso feeding tube so that if I really got in a bad way I could go to emergency I could have a naso feeding tube placed and we could run formula again but we never ended up needing to do that which is really really incredible so we kind of had our what ifs in place when we did remove it in order to keep me safe but I also had the option of drinking formula if I really needed to but that was a great option it didn't make me feel good at all yeah it was just such a milestone such a milestone and such a thing to celebrate it really skyrocketed my recovery from there and now we are in February 2024 and I can basically don't have pain anymore when I eat so I'm still on an animal based diet. I eat mostly meat but I also have some fruit and honey and I'll have vegetables on occasion and I can eat a portion of meat and I won't feel any pain, any nausea, no symptoms at all. I still eat kind of smaller than the regular and more often. I have had instances where I have eaten a full meal and I haven't felt like really really in pain if I like gorge myself then I will but like anybody will so I have kind of a circle of what would be my safe foods now that I eat on an everyday basis but there has been some instances where I have gone out from that and I have been okay I'm just working on introducing more food just in the Christmas that just went by in 2023 like I had beef ribs for lunch with vegetables and aioli and all these sort of things and I did really well and I ate kind of like a normal meal portion and just really incredible I still avoid seed oils and inflammatory vegetable oils because that was such a major part in my healing but basically getting that endometriosis excision surgery getting on those medications to help kind of settle down that mast cell response settle down that nerves and then slowly incorporating and building up to this animal based diet is what really helped me heal if I eat a lot of vegetables then I will have some digestive discomfort but on my day to day what I eat day to day I don't have digestive discomfort like my digestive system is working really really well I'm really regular I poop great now which is great because you know there were years where it's either too much or too little if you know what I mean I just can't believe it myself because I was diagnosed with an anatomical condition 
I was told that like I would only deteriorate, I'd never get better and even a feeding tube wouldn't be enough but now I'm here. So I do think I can probably get to the place where I will be able to wean off those medications as well because I'm just getting better and better and better and better as time goes on. I can't believe that just eating meat could have all this improvement. It was really just what my body needed and getting rid of the stuff that was inflaming my body really helped. That's basically the story of how I got my feeding tube removed. I just want to say if you are struggling with this and if you're suffering, my heart really goes out to you and I feel so much compassion for you. And I really hope that this video doesn't make it sound like it was easy to come off a feeding tube because it's not. For anyone watching this video who knows someone who has a feeding tube, <laughs> please don't say to them like, oh all you have to do is eat some meat like it's such a complex thing and everybody's situation is different it needs to be done under the care of medical professionals and it's it's a really really real thing it's a really scary thing and it's a really really complex and difficult thing so if you're going through that or if you know someone going through that my heart goes out to you i really feel compelled to share my story and what's helped me just in the hope that it'll help someone else because i feel like if it can help just one person then it's all worth it and i just hope that as many people as possible can see healing and see improvement thank you guys so much for watching this video i really hope it was helpful for you um feeding tube for almost two years now um, um, abdomen, abdominal surgical feeding tube pretty much the entire time I've had trouble with infection and you guys know that when I first had it placed I got that hospital infection and it was a really big ordeal it took me five months to recover from my surgery and I have been fighting that infection on and off ever since and last year when I was getting those we were really fighting to keep my feeding tube because that was really the only viable option for me at that time but now um it's it's a it's been quite a while and i am doing a lot better this year um i have been i've shared a bit a bit about this in my vlogs that you know i transitioned from the pack of potato chips to um like actual potato chips and that I've slowly been increasing my oral intake and I've slowly been decreasing my formula and in the last little while I actually haven't been on much formula anyway because I've had such a struggle finding formula that um, that works for me and that I can tolerate so I've just been sustaining myself orally mostly with cooked potato chips and eggs um, and apple juice and at the moment I've been maintaining my weight fine and I've also been able to tolerate supplements that background noise is my drinking I've also been able to tolerate supplements so all of that was just not really an option a year ago and um, circ endometriosis surgery, catodophen, sodium chromoglycate, and digestive enzymes are all things that I've started, except for the sodium chromoglycate, all those other things are things that I've started since the end of last year, and they've all helped me a lot. So now that I'm in a different place this year than I was this time last year, I'm very seriously considering having my feeding tube removed and just seeing how I go trying to sustain myself orally. And yes, it'll be uncomfortable. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it causes me nausea. Yes, it makes me feel sick. Yes, it makes me bloat. Yes, I feel horrible, but I'm maintaining my weight and I'm no longer at risk of death like I was when I started this journey. 
Um, so, when I was talking to my gastro, he said that because the feeding tube is a foreign object and it's technically in an open wound, this is an open hole that goes from the outside of my body to the inside of my body, um, is what causes those infections to be hard to treat, to be ongoing and to be chronic and you usually need really heavy antibiotics to treat it. And even last year when I had heavy biotics, it didn't treat it properly and so that's why it's still a problem and coming back. So the only way to really get rid of that is to take the tube out, let it heal up and let those heal. And but the 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 damage that already having all those antibiotics has done on my gut and will continue to do on my gut really doesn't serve what my goals are and what I'm trying to achieve and it really will set me back. I'm trying to do everything that I can to increase my oral um, capacity and my goal has always been to get off a feeding tube and to get to a place where I can eat healthily again and being on constant antibiotics and regular strong antibiotics and having infections around my, the area of my stomach is not serving that goal at all. It's just setting me back and setting me back and setting me back and I'm getting further away from where I want to be. And last year, like this time last year, there's nothing I could do about that. It was the same situation last year, like, um, but there was nothing really I could do about it. He said that when I got the feeding tube placed, it was a really difficult recovery for me. I was in a lot of pain, so it wouldn't be his ideal for me to have it taken out. But at the same breath, he also can completely 100% see why I'm considering it and the benefits that that could do to my for my body. He said he'd hate to have to put me through the surgery again. And honestly, it was traumatic. I'd hate to have to go through it again because once I have this feeding tube out, the stoma will close up. And so then they need to redo the entire surgery, place a new stoma and all of that. And I need to go through all of that again. And you guys know that was really traumatic for me. So that's why I have waited so long and been trying to treat these infections for so long and trying to keep my tube for so long and so that I don't have to go through that again. But I just feeling like, you know, there's gotta be an end point and there's gotta be a place where you kind of go, all right, enough's enough. Um, and so I am now just trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. So I've mostly been sustaining myself orally, which in itself is a miracle. And I am just so grateful for it. There's only a few foods that I'm eating that like, there's only a few foods that I'm tolerating that I'm just eating only those foods. So my diet isn't broad by any means, but I'm tolerating those foods okay. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. I am so grateful that I'm considering this in this place of privilege of, what do you think this? <gasps> she just pulled out my shallots off off she just pulled out my shallots <laughs> that was the last one left because she's pulled them all out the camera's sitting in a, a, a what do you call them a garden pot a plant pot um so yeah i'm really grateful that i'm in this situation of privilege that i wasn't last year when we were considering taking my tube out because of infection last year this time last year was that we needed to keep my tube but now I'm in this place of privilege, this time this year, I can consider actually having it out and sustaining myself orally without a tube. Um, the issue is though that it's like not quite enough to completely cold turkey no tube. Um, I still am putting supplements down my tube. I'm not quite completely independent of my tube. The issue with these conditions is that they're not linear and they're not necessarily stable. So just because I'm doing okay now doesn't mean that in three months time I will still be doing the same. Um, like there have been times where I've been better, times where I've been worse. So that's why I really wanted to hold on to my tube as well. So we're just kind of trying to figure out what our options are as to what I can do instead of my surgical feeding tube. So there is the option of having a nasojejunal tube, so that's through the nose into the intestines, bypassing the stomach. That tube has to be placed um, either endoscopically or through interventional radiology because it goes to the intestines and it has to be in all the time. 
My other option is an NG tube. So that's through my nose and to my stomach. And I asked my gastroenterologist if there is any chance that I can be trained on how to place this myself so that I can just place it when I'm having formula or when I'm having supplements and then take it out again to try and bypass all the issues that I was having with my naso tube being constantly in all the time. So I was having a lot of pain with that. I was having constant gagging, but also I was having some infections in my throat and stuff from that. So he said that that sounds like a good idea, but he wouldn't know who could train me. He said there's there's nobody who specializes in that. Like you don't go to somebody to be trained to do that. There's no like NG placing training doctor he said usually it'd be the nurses in the hospital who would train you to do that so he said that he's happy for me to do that as long as I can find someone who can train me so that's a big hurdle because that's not just something that's easy to do but and the other issue with that is it's not bypassing my stomach it goes into my stomach so I will I it will cause me pain it will cause me nausea it will um cause me to feel sick and uncomfortable but the thing that I'm weighing up here will that discomfort decrease my quality of life more than the constant infections from the surgical tube or will the surgical tube decrease my quality of life more than the NG tube so that is just the things that we are kind of weighing up at the moment and there's this level of anxiety because I don't know how long I'm going to be able to sustain myself orally and what the future looks like but I've kind of got to the point where my goal my goal is still to heal and I know that some people may think that's stupid and the doctors have told me that um, I'll never get better but I, I'm not going to ever give up hope and it's still my goal to at least progress and this situation really isn't serving that and it's just it's decreased my quality of life so much more and we really need any quality of life that we can get at this point so i am thinking of having both g tubes and uh, ng tubes and nj tubes at home and having my gastroenterologist write up request forms so that if I have an issue, the times where I mostly need my feeding tube the most, like rely on it the most, is when I'm sick at COVID, ironically when I have an infection from the feeding tube, just situations like that. So if I'm in a situation like that, I figure I can go to hospital, get it placed, and if I really get stuck, if I'm really in a situation where I'm dehydrated, I can go to the hospital. Um, the difference now to a few years ago is I now have a team who I've got the, like, oh, a few years ago we didn't know what was going on. So we didn't know how to help or who to help. But now we've, we know what's going on. We know what helps and and who can help. So I've got that team around who knows my condition, knows what we can do to help. So it's much, much quicker and easier to have that there rather than already being severely underway and trying to figure out what's going on and who can help me find a solution. So I think because of that, because I've already got that team, I'm not going to get to a place where I'm severely underweight because as soon as I start going to that direction, I can call my doctor and say, look, we need a, um, this is happening. What can we do? And if we need to, we can place a naso tube. I do know that this could mean that in three months, six months, five years, whenever, I may need to get another surgical tube placed, and that's hard, but I also know that potentially it may not be, it may be a totally different situation. So, um, yes, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. I am in this space that's a really weird mental space i've been super emotional and super stressed but on this one hand i feel really excited because i'm looking at getting my tube removed and i've come so far to be able to even consider that and that is just insane and so exciting and then on the other hand i'm like i'm not quite ready like i'd like to be a little bit further before i really take the leap in getting a tube taken out and i still use it and i still there's cases where it's good to have it and um and that that can cause some anxiety so i'm not quite ready but i'm kind of being forced into it i just really think that it's 
I just really think that it's it's time it's the best thing to do for my body and we will figure out what to do with issues that come up when they come up and even though that can be stressful and traumatic and decrease quality of life like I just feel like something's got to give at the moment and um <laughs> there's no perfect solution and that's what's the hardest thing about all these conditions so that's my super long update and thought processes um but yeah, overall I'm excited and scared, but mostly excited and I'm incredibly grateful. I'm incredibly grateful to be in a this position of privilege um, where I can think about having my tube removed and I know that so many of you watching just don't have that and so my heart goes out to you. And I want you to know that I'm thinking of you and I'm praying for you and I'm rooting for you. And I, and I think that you guys are such strong warriors and you got this. You can get through this and um, yeah, we're all in this together. So 